What chapter did we read this past week? John 21. Sounds like you all did your homework. Good job. If you have your Bibles this morning, you might want to turn to John 21. If you have your cell phones or whatever you, tablets, whatever you have your Bible on, or you can just look at the screens, the scripture will be up there as well. But um, I'll give you time to get there uh, on, in your Bibles, but you know the scene. Simon Peter has spoken some pretty mighty words about his devotion and his intention to follow Christ even to the death, he said. And he's been a miserable failure. Because the moment he was parted from Jesus, when Jesus was dragged out of the garden to then be uh, sat before the Pharisees and Sadducees to be beaten and tortured, um, it was about three o'clock. It was three o'clock in the morning because it says then it was the changing of the guard. And they have a changing of the guard at 6, 9, 12, 3, and then they're done because 6 a.m. starts the next day. And so it starts all over. All right. So the third uh, calling of the guard happened about 3 a.m. And it was at that time that Peter had already denied Christ twice. But now he's up by this charcoal fire trying to stay warm. There's probably somebody with a marshmallow stick and somebody else with a, a hot dog. And, it, well, I don't know, at 3 o'clock in the morning. But uh, he, this little girl came up to him, and he denied Christ in front of her like he was scared of her. And after he had denied Christ that third time, it says, then the changing of the guard, and Christ was led out from the temple courts. And his eyes met Peter's. And he went out and he wept. Hmm. Pretty miserable failure there. You know what? I I know it was because I've been there before too. There's times I've failed Christ. And uh, after the resurrection now, Peter knows that Jesus is alive. He knows who wins, but he's not quite sure where he fits in. And Jesus isn't around all the time. He kind of comes and goes. So he said, hey, boys, I don't know about you, but I'm going fishing. He's returning back to where he was just before Jesus called him. Because when Jesus called him, what was he doing? Fishing. As many of them were. And Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Right? So it's like a big um, deja vu. And as if that wasn't enough, they went out fishing that night and caught nothing. Nick Zibley, nothing. And uh, this guy over on the shore come morning said, hey, boys, how's fishing? And they said, "Eh, not a thing. He goes, Try it over the right side of the boat. And they did. And the net came out with so much fish that it said they were, they, it was, they were afraid the boat was going to go down. So they start going for the shore, right? And um, the guy that was on the shore, they hadn't recognized. But when they got closer, Peter recognized it was Jesus, right? And it says he jumped out of that perfectly good boat and started sloshing his way to shore. And... Um, He got up to shore and then realized that his job was to be um, with the boys to bring those fish in because they were struggling. So it says he sloshed back out and helped them bring in the boat. And if you remember from last week, they decided to count the fish, and they were how many? 153, that's right. Now, so you know that's what fishermen do. They always count, measure, you know, know, it was... um, there we go. It was this long, right? We've all heard fish stories. I've told fish stories. And uh, when Peter meets Jesus by this charcoal fire, he's cooking breakfast for his men. Perhaps it brought back that time where just a few days ago, because, you know, charcoal fires have a distinct smell, don't they? And it took him right back to that moment where he denied Christ for the third time. I think maybe that's why he sloshed back, back out to help the boys in. Because Jesus already had fish on the grill. Now, in that context, Jesus asks what I believe is the most important question he ever asked. 
Everything about your present, everything about your future, um, everything about any ministry like bringing in disciples that you ever hope to have, because that's who we are. We love the Lord, love one another, and we make disciples, right? But if you want to have that ministry, then you have to answer this question, I believe. And I know you know what it is. Let us receive the word of God. I'm going to begin in verse 15. Then when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Now I asked you to figure out what, what these were. Do you truly love me more than what? These disciples? Do you truly love me more than, I don't know, these fish? Did you think it through? I think it was the scalies, the slimies. I think it was the fish. I really do. Because we knew how much Peter loved the other men. So the other, th other thing is, is that when he didn't know what to do, he went right back to fishing. The boys were welcome to come with him, but he, he was expecting nothing. And so um, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. And again, Jesus said, I'm in verse 16 now, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Notice he didn't say, do you love me more than these? He just said, do you love me? That first love was like Philadelphia is what it's called, or brotherly love, okay? The next love was, um, this next love that's coming up is a love of affection, okay? And he says, uh, Simon Peter, do you truly love me more or do you truly love me? And he, he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, take care of my sheep. And now Jesus asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This time he's asking him, do you agape love me? Complete love, an entire love where you're sold out to someone, where every part of you belongs to that person. Hmm. And Peter was grieved because he said to him that third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Let's pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So, why does, ask, why does Jesus ask uh, Peter three times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? We don't know for sure, but some people have equated it to the three denials, right? That's a possibility. But I want you to know something. If that's the truth, you've got to look at the, uh, at the uh, converse of it, all right? Because Jesus didn't ask him, did you fail me or did you deny me? three times, he simply says, do you love me? <laughs> if you answered that question right now, do you love Jesus? Well, <laughs> what's the right answer? I mean, we're in church. Of course we're all going to say, Jesus, I love you, right? Right? right. Hey, okay. I just want to make sure you're not asleep yet. You're going to instinctively say, you know that I love you. And Jesus says, do you really, basically? Truly. Think about this, please. If you don't answer this for the next few minutes, I want to unpack a little bit more of, uh, of what the Lord has shown me. But understand that everything hinges on your answer to this question. In the Christian life, that's the truth. It hinges out of, do you really love Jesus? I'll ask you this question when we get towards the end. But understand, it's all revolving around what I believe is the most important question. So, let me say this. I cannot go very far without um, confronting an issue that I think plagues nearly every church in these United States. That's as far as I'll go, okay? Um, but it's this that um, 
There are men and women in the Church of Christ who I believe have what I would call a second-hand faith. Um, they don't yet have their own. The answer to, you know, well, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, my mom's got enough faith for all of us here. You ever heard somebody say that? Or, or my grandma, she's going to pray me into heaven. Right? People who have a secondhand faith but don't yet have their own. And Jesus moves in very personally here. As he already had with Peter, and he said, Well, who do you say that I am? And uh, Peter and his disciples had kind of they gave Jesus the Gallup poll results. You know, well, 42% say you're John the Baptist, 16%. And Jesus said, no, not what people are saying. Who do you say I am? Hmm. And now he says, do you love me? See, it was possible for Judas to walk for three years with the living Christ and miss it. Whew, right over his head. It was possible for Thomas to walk for three years with his Redeemer and Lord. And yet, it, he, had, he could not believe until he saw the wounds in the Savior's hands. The place where the, the, the spear had, had riven him and the, the, the nails through his feet. It is possible to attend New Leaf Church for three years to 33 years to whatever and miss it. And this is one of the uncomfortable questions in our faith because, you know, your parents may love him, your grandparents may love him, your girlfriend, your wife, your, but do you, Jesus asks us this morning, do you love him? We love him because he first loved us, Scripture says, and we're overwhelmed when we go to the foot of the cross and considered what he went through. The stripes on his back are healing the scars in his hands, his feet, his side. See, that's why we always, when we talk about Christ, we always bring up the cross. And I always bring up redemp or the uh, tomb as well. But we always bring up the cross because that's where we meet Christ. Do you not, did you notice that when Thomas was asked this question, basically, Jesus more or less said, um, do you believe now, Thomas? And uh, he invited him to come put his hand in his side and touch his wounds. On his, and all Thomas did was fall on his face before God, before Jesus. And he said, my Lord and my God. Look at that story in, in the, the, the Passion and just after the Passion. He didn't say, oh, Lord and God. No. He said, my Lord, my God. And maybe that two-letter word is, is what's going to be important to you. You know, I can't come to New Leaf and I just know too much. can't come here and assume that because you're here and you know all the big words and we can speak Christianese together, that you've gotten beyond your head knowledge of knowing some stuff about Christ and loving Christ when you know him with the essence of who you are, or some people say you know him with all your heart. Hmm. But just know this. Every time you're challenged to give your life to Christ and to love him, and you decide not to do it, your heart gets harder. The essence of who you are and your connection with Christ gets more calloused every time and calluses can build up pretty good Have you ever noticed like your feet and your hands you can get calluses on them and i'll tell you what every time you get a callus it's harder for you to feel and there are, there will come a time when eventually you won't be able to hear the voice of the holy spirit beckoning you to come home come home to a place where you love christ in every way, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and voice. Has there ever been a moment for 
Like when you stepped up the cross or gone to prayer is what that means. And said, for me, you died for me. You ever had that moment when there, you had that realization that it was for you? And he was there in your stead. And what's your, resu- what's your response? You know, I don't know. Somebody gives their life for me. I, I don't know any other response but to love. So glad that wasn't me, man. I love you. You know, in Galatians 2.20, it says, The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's that two-letter word. It's so important. Maybe you've been trying to make a second-hand faith work and you're, you know, frustrated. Maybe you know a lot of hypocrites. Well, so do I. And there's times when I've been one to my chagrin. But I want you to know this. Jesus is no hypocrite. Hmm. That death is for me. Those sins are mine. You are my Lord and my God. That's how it is when you come to know whether you truly love him or not. Hmm. Now, Why do I say this is the most important question? Well, do you love me? What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and strength, right? Right? Greatest commandment. Second one's like it, love your neighbor, okay? So it says love the Lord your God. Now notice it doesn't say serve the Lord your God. It doesn't say um, go believe in him with no. It says, do do you love the Lord your God? The greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. So it makes sense to me that when Jesus asked the question, do you love me? It might be the most important question he ever asked. And you know, for someone here perhaps, um, what used to be a warm and vibrant relationship between you and Christ has kind of died down. It's become kind of cold and official and theological. And, you know, okay, Sunday, got to go to church. Maybe I'll watch it. I don't know. Um, I'll go to the 11. I can't get up yet. You know what I'm saying? It becomes something where we don't, it's not about love anymore. So when the song asks us the question, what's love got to do with it? I say everything. Because it's what Jesus did for us. And our response is to realize it was for each of us. It was for me. Do you remember um, in Revelation 2, there's this church that sounds like it's about to receive the Church of the Year Award, the Church of Ephesus? Um, The way it goes is Jesus said to them, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. You cannot tolerate wicked men. You have tested men who claim to be apostles but were not, and you found them false. You've endured, persevered, endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Now what more could you ask of any believer? Work hard, believe the truth, fight for the truth, don't compromise, don't give up, go to church. Wow. And what does Jesus say to him? Yet I hold this against you. <laughs> I hold this against you. Busy, orthodox, committed Christian. You have forsaken your first love. Wow. You're so busy about me, but you don't love me like you used to. Remember the height from which you have fallen, he says. You know, it looks like these people are at their height with how Jesus began that long sentence. He's saying, I liked you better maybe when you weren't so busy and you spent some time loving me. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your Influence, your lampstand is what it says, but that refers to your influence 
from its place. Influence to do what? To go out and invest in the true riches of the kingdom. That means finding folks that don't yet know him. That's what Jesus said was the, the, the highest of the riches, worth more than gold and silver, was to find one and connect them with him. Tell them about the cross, and when they're all in and they believe, they're going to have to answer this same question too. Do you love me? Hmm. Now, before we ask the question here at the end, I want to go through a couple of things real fast. Uh Uh-huh, thank you. First of all, we need to consider the power of loving Jesus. John 14, Jesus talks about why the central issue is loving him. What I'm trying to show you is that this do you love me question has been supported through all points along Jesus' mission and ministry during those three years, okay? So, John 14, verse 15, if you obey me, you will love me. Now, if your Bible says that, toss it. There's no Bible that says that. You need to get a new one. Jesus says, now, that may be how we live sometimes, but, you know, if you do all the right things, you'll love me. No. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commands. If anyone loves me, they will obey my teaching. My Father will love them. We will come to them. We will make our home with them. You see, if you really love Jesus... All the other stuff just happens. Some of us have been trying so hard to do the Christian thing, but if you love Christ, it comes naturally. It flows from within you. I've told you this story before. I knew a fellow back in seminary. Um, His name's Dan. He was this all-American type of guy. And back then, we were all in our, I don't know, 20s and 30s, and he was single. He had a few pounds to lose. Didn't like to shave so much. Didn't know what a comb or a brush was. And um, he uh, was a rock and roll type of guy. Any, anybody here a rock and roll person? Okay. He hated classical music, though. Hated it. Anybody here a classical music fan? Okay, great. So, something strange started to happen during the time that we were in uh, seminary, sitting in the back row um, learning <laughs> And I noticed that uh, Dan was trimming down, lost a few pounds, dressing a little nicer, you know, instead of the crumpled shirt that he just wore the day before. Now he's in nice, crisp clothes. He had discovered the art of putting your clothes in the dryer, and while they were warm, making sure they were hung up or that you wore it right away and got rid of the wrinkles, and it was just awesome. And this guy was actually shaving. And then one day I looked at the top of his book bag as he had sat it down next to the chair, and there was a CD there. You know what that CD was? Handel's Messiah. Classical music. And I'm like, what's going on? He was choosing to listen to classical music? Why? Karen. That's why. Yeah. Isn't it amazing the difference love makes? You know, could I or any of his friends manage to change? No way. But he meets Karen. And out of his love, it naturally flowed. Oh, I want to look nice for her. Shave, comb, um, nice clothes. Love. The difference is love. When you love someone, all the other stuff just kind of flows in. Last thing I want to say is, Togetherness happens when you love somebody. It's just, it happens. Um, Someone with all the busyness of this world, you know, has to go to work, has all these assignments, has to uh, make all these meetings. You know what? It doesn't matter. If they fall in love with somebody, they will make time to be with them. Because when you love someone, togetherness happens. That's why David in Psalm 42 cried out, when can I go and meet with God? That's the cry of a Jesus lover. Let me close with this illustration. Any of you remember a 
ride from the carnival or the amusement park called a rotor. You open the door, it's all round, and your job is to go around and stand all the way around the sides. And all they say is stay at the side. There were no belts, no, no way to, to hold you in place. You just stayed at the side. And uh, what happens is there's a thing called centrifugal force that we learned about in sixth grade science. You remember that? Centrifugal force means that the faster that something spins, things are thrown to the edge. Right? Has that, is that where Jesus at, is at in your life? Busy Christian? Has he been thrown to the edge? Has he been a victim of spiritual centrifugal force? I want you to consider that because we're going to ask the question now. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Lord, we know how it goes. We know how busy we get. But we want to come back to the basics. We want to return to our first love. We don't want to look and be like a good church. Lord, we want to be a church that loves you. So we ask now, as each person answers the question for themselves, do you love me? that you would be with them. Thank you, Jesus. Take time now to do that. Amen. I'm going to ask our ushers to come.